Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. The world was shocked yesterday with the death of anti apartheid hero. And of course, uh, Archbishop of Cape Town is also the primate of the Anglican Church of South Africa. And at one time, the chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Archbishop Desmond Mpilo Tutu. Uh, of course, the world leaders, including here in Nigeria and across well, the whole of the world, President Obama also, put out messages you know, to his family and, of course, uh, to commiserate with the South African government and the South African people you know, after the death of this icon. It was called the voice of our conscience. And uh, that's what I, we're going to be talking about this morning with our international affairs expert, uh, Paul Ijime. But just before that, uh, we have a quick biography of uh, um, Archbishop uh, Mpilo Tutu, Desmond Mpilo Tutu, to share with you. And of course, also a quick interview that was done yesterday. Uh, we'll be back right after this. The reason for this commission is opening wounds, cleansing them so that they do not fester, and saying, we have dealt with our past as effectively as we could. We have not denied it. We have looked the beast in the eye. Archbishop Desmond Mpilo Tutu, born in Kirkstop, Transvaal, on 7th October 1931 in South Africa, was a strong voice against apartheid in South Africa. In the transition to democracy, Tutu was an influential figure, promoting the concept of forgiveness and reconciliation. He was recognized as the moral conscience of South Africa as he frequently lent his voice to issues of justice and peace. After the passage of apartheid Bantu Education Act in 1953, Tutu resigned from teaching in protest at the diminished opportunities for black South Africans. He continued to study, concentrating on theology. In 1955, he married Namalizu Lia Shenzane. They had four children together, and in 1961, he was ordained an Anglican priest. Tutu moved to England in 1962, where he studied at King's College, London, and gained a master's degree in theology. He also became a part-time curate in St. Albans and Golders Green. Five years after, he returned to South Africa and became increasingly involved in the anti-apartheid movement. He was influenced, among others, by fellow Anglican Bishop Trevor Hoddleston. Tutu's understanding of the Gospels and his Christian faith meant he felt compelled to take a stand and speak out against injustice. O oh, Holy Spirit, calm the turmoil within. In 1976, there were increasing levels of protest by black South Africans against apartheid especially in Soweto. In one of his speeches, Tutu said, far too often people think of themselves as just individuals separated from one another, whereas we are connected and what we do affects the whole world. When you do well, it spreads out. It is for the whole of humanity, according to him. In his position as a leading member of the clergy, Desmond Tutu used his influence to speak firmly and unequivocally against apartheid, often comparing it to fascist regimes. One of his favorite words in bringing people together was Ubuntu, meaning I am because we are. You, like all of us, were shocked and I would like to express condolences to Mama Lea and the children family. But I must say that, I mean, Archbishop Desmond Tutu has been a prophet amongst us. And he lived amongst us, stood for the truth, stood for justice here in South Africa and internationally. And he did it without fear, believing what he believed, that God is a God of justice. And I think instead of mourning him, we should actually celebrate his life. And that's the call I've made here in South Africa, uh, to say that let's celebrate his life because 
he played an important role in, the, in our lives in getting rid of the apartheid system in South Africa and, and, and took risks. I mean, he used to stand in between bulldozers and victims of the apartheid system, which was forcefully removing them from their homes. Uh, he used to stand in between angry mobs who were angry about apartheid and wanted to kill people. He is the example of what God's justice is about. Okay, uh, well spoken of um, the late legend. So uh, what are South Africans going to miss about him because when we hear him speak he is not a selfish person he's very very selfless so what are those things that south africans will really miss about him well you know we, we will we'll miss his love will miss his laughter you know he was even at the worst moments he would uh, laugh but we will miss also his solidarity with victims of society here in South Africa and internationally. I mean, he has taken on causes of justice internationally. But, you know, fortunately, with modern technology, we can still listen to him. We can still um, um, listen to the, receive the messages that he sent to us. And we can repeat what he has said and nobody can say i have forgotten and i don't know uh, and from this morning that you know all his history has come up in a big way and that to me will remain a permanent witness amongst us so he's not gone he's with us he, like all of us were shocked Yes, of course, a quick conversation on the life and times of uh, anti apartheid hero Desmond Mpilo Tutu. This morning we're speaking with our international affairs expert, uh, Mr. Paul Ejime. Morning to you. Thanks for joining us. And stood for the truth. Same to you, and of course, uh, good to see you this morning. Um, it's not a very happy time, of course, uh, across Africa and across the world also. It seems like the world has lost one of its loudest voices. And, you know, like I said earlier, uh, he was popularly called the voice of our conscience. Um, but quickly share your views on what exactly the death of Desmond Tutu means uh, for, of course, South Africa and the rest of the world. So, well, uh, deepest condolences to his immediate family, South Africans, uh, Africa, and then the world in general, because it, here was a colossus of a man that touched um, not just um, the, uh, where he came from, but across the world. And um, let me pick up from where the last um, speaker talked about that. Perhaps what we could do is to um, celebrate him. And the greatest um, uh, uh, tribute we can pay is uh, to try to put into practice some of the legacies he left behind. And what are they? It is about justice, it is about peace, it is about nonviolence, it is about, um, you know, humanity. Because that is what matters. And uh, the fact that uh, he lived a life at 90, I think he, he wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, called a small boy. But he touched lives in very many places, not just Africa, we have talked about anti-apartheid, but also in places like Britain, when he visited, he talked about two nations there. And they were before um, Black Lives Matter, he mentioned that um, they, they, they had too many blacks in prison. And so that was, he had that knack of speaking uh, truth to power. When he went to in, in Israel, he told them that the way they were treating the Palestinians was no good. And in the U.S. recently, he talked, he, he told um, uh, former President Trump that um, uh, recognizing, you know, making Israel, uh, you know, Jerusalem, the capital of Israel was uh, cutting um, uh, uh, the rich. And then what about our own continent? In, in uh, Zimbabwe, even though he was a freedom fighter, he had scores to settle with um, uh, uh, President Mugabe when he became uh, a dictator. Even Mandela that um, he supported, um, when Mandela was also um, president, he had issues with uh, some of the policies that he had. And then back here in Nigeria, he, he was sent to... Uh, 
um, former president, former uh, military ruler, Abacha, for the release of um, people like um, uh, MKO who were in, in prison. And then they had also talked about Kensaro Uwa. Hence, um, after his execution, uh, Mandela led the, um, uh, the, 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 the expulsion of uh, Nigeria from uh, uh, from the Commonwealth. So here was a man that uh, didn't really, he was uh, not, um, uh, he was selfless. He was concerned about uh, the downtrodden. He, he, he talked about, hence he's com uh, called uh, a moral compass. Uh, even he also um, engaged in some self-deprecation. He talked to, to his church when they were about the fixation about, um, you know, uh, 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 ordaining um, uh, women, priests, or homosexuality. He said there are more people, there are more, uh, pro, you know, issues of priority like poverty that the church will deal with instead of uh, getting into the issue of uh, sexual orientation of people. So that is the man. And um, I think one um, one pain that he will take with him is that and the, the commission that he headed, where he um, expressed so much emotion about um, truth and reconciliation, that commission has never been um, uh, implemented. Reason being that South Africans, uh, a white minority opposed it, ANC opposed it, and this he also um, had uh, some um, uh, strong word from uh, for uh, the ANC, telling them that the black. Um, uh, 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 the empowerment of uh, that they were uh, uh, that they were talking about hasn't really worked. Yeah. The black uh, rich people now replace them um, white um, uh, uh, South Africans in the control of the economy. So here we have a man who believed in justice, who uh, actually coined um, uh, South Africa uh, Rainbow Nation because of the. A, a, a pot party, the mixture of, of, of um, uh, uh, you know, inequalities, uh, racial, uh, and then uh, divisions that are there. Uh, the hands were, were hard more, and the, the poor getting poorer. Yeah. So, but Besides I believe man. in Ubuntu. That, yes, okay, that uh, you are, I am because you are. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I, I want to, you know, speak a little bit more about the anti appetite struggle. Uh, that he, of course, uh, was one of those who championed um, it. Uh, you know, right after, of course, appetite was uh, kicked away, there still is, you know, some level of racial segregation in South Africa. Um, and then, of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that you mentioned also. Do you think that there are certain things that Desmond Tutu would also see as, you know, regrets um, or, you know, failures, you know, with you know, being able to achieve them to its, you know, fullest, you know, level if possible. I think he gave every, every endeavor his uh, uh, best. If anything, I wouldn't say it's failure, but um, uncompleted, unfinished business. I think that is what it is. Because he tried his best. He led um, a commission that brought out uh, the brutality, you know, the, the, the horrific... Uh, 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 events that uh, characterize the, the apartheid uh, 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 regime. But also, not just um, uh, you know, atrocities committed by, by whites, but also by the blacks. Because he believed in um, non-violence. He said, um, you know, you can achieve a lot through um, uh, negotiation, through talking. And the fact that um, um, at the end of the day, we are all human. And that um, God is no God of any particular group, whether white, whether Christians. In fact, he said that Christians do not have the guarantee that they will go to heaven. So he, he was a, 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 a people, a, a pro people. That is what it is, and pro humanity. And so he will see the fact that uh, that, that report has not been, a, uh, and it remains a blight on those who are ruling South Africa today. You see some African countries copying that example, even though it has not been um, uh, taken to its um, uh, logical conclusion. But it tells a lot about the fact that after a conflict, after some um, uh, 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 horrendous atrocities, what you need to do is to bring reconciliation. You can never take that away. Whether you, you go ahead and do it 
than to harm us becomes another issue. But he has made his recommendation. He lived his life. Um, in, any, in fact, like uh, the last speaker said, uh, thank God for digital technology. We can still go back to um, what he said, some of those thoughts that they had. And um, that is the fact that he's still around with us. And how can we mourn him? How can we pay tribute to him? Is to uh, draw from the legacy, the rich legacy that he has left the world, the legacy of peace, the legacy of uh, humanity, the legacy of nonviolence, the legacy of, uh, of equality, the legacy of uh, uh, pro respect for human rights, the legacy of humility, no matter where you are. Because here was a man, very humble, unassuming, and then down to earth. And so um, you, he leave his world. We have to celebrate him instead of mourning. And how do we do that? By making sure that we, we emulate some of those uh, principles and those ideals that he lived for. Okay. Um, even after post appetite, uh, you also want to agree with me that Desmond Tutu was very critical of the ANC. And uh, he, especially when he knew that South Africa was misrepresented. And as high profile as he was, there were times where even a police officer had to ask him to shut up because he was not vice Jesus uh, during that council visit to Lama. And so uh, what would you consider, what would you consider um, Desmond Tutu's legacy on, I mean, the impact on growing movements across holding government accountable? What would you uh, consider as his legacy or, I mean, the impact of his legacy on growing movements across the entire world, especially in Africa, in holding governments accountable? Well, difficult, but one thing was his uh, boldness, his courage. You know, you talked about being, being tear gas, being arrested, being uh, uh, assaulted or insulted, but he never gave up. We must not give up. We have to come out, you know, how many people can they kill? He was not afraid to die, he said. And that is the issue. That this idea of um, people, you know, tickling out or um, hiding under behind their fingers when horrendous things are happening, when our leaders are behaving as if uh, they do not owe anybody any responsibility or accountability, it must stop. But how do we stop it? It has to follow to choose example. Coming on the streets, he wasn't afraid to, to lead a protest. You know, against uh, 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 anti people uh, policies. And there are so many of them everywhere in Africa, in the world today. And so the world should do well to copy him, to emulate him. Don't be afraid, come out. You can never die twice. You know, and what you do lives after you. It is not about you, it's about how you touch people, about what you, the impression you left, the legacies you left, and that is what we are talking about. That is not about the number of houses he owned, the acquisitions, he had the, the opportunity to do all that, but he was a fellow. He was a man who, uh, you know, everybody could, uh, res you know, uh, uh, re relate with. He was a man that spoke truth to power and was not afraid. I think that is the greatest thing. The courage to tell our leaders when they are wrong, not to be hallelujah people, or you know, everybody preach, even when we know people are suffering, people are dying, but yet people are, God that's are burying their heads. Those who you speak are hiding. What is, what are they afraid of? Let them emulate um, uh, Des Desmond Tutu, well, um, um, the arch, they call him. Talk, talking about emulating Desmond Tutu, let's bring it down here to Nigeria, um, you know, and get your views on persons that may be, you know, doing pretty much same. Uh, do you think that we still have persons who have uh, taken, you know, uh, from the life of Desmond Tutu and been able to stand um, in the face of opposition and, and speak truth to power? And also being able to stand and promote unity at all times. If you remember, um, you know, something you mentioned also, you know, the, the fact that he didn't think that, uh, you know, um, uh, criticizing uh, the sexual orientation of the next person was the most important thing in Africa. His daughter uh, got married to a woman, if, if you also are aware of that. Um, and he didn't have any challenges with it, even as an Anglican, you know, archbishop. Um, so in Nigeria, do you think that we have that quality of, of leadership, you know, political traditional and religious leadership um are there people that you can point to that are you know pretty much doing the same thing well 
uh, you have this knack for uh, 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 bringing the ball to the um, uh, uh, then the um, uh, uh, the center. You know, no, the, the penalty area. Very soon now you'll be scoring the penalty. Well, the point is that uh, you're asking me to uh, to uh, ruffle some some um, uh, feathers, but there is nothing like the truth. You can't hide away from it. The 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 the, the um, um, uh, people like uh, the. Uh, um, uh, Ghanifawa means they have now become an endangered species in our country, which is uh, unfortunate. And uh, because things are happening that ordinarily should uh, let people come out and then lead uh, some, you remember the ransom cooties, you know, the Beko and others, remember Fela, remember, you know, um, uh, Rochimi Williams, and all of them. Um, Nigeria had never been short of all those uh, uh, kind of people, but what has happened is that I think we have gotten used to um, uh, politics has spoiled so many things. Politics has damaged a lot of things, and then the commercialization of politics. Value systems have now gone. People are a, a, a father, parents are now showing their, their children that they can steal government money and then put them somewhere. And then the child, what do they, the children, what do they do? They now go and take from there, and then you are, you are no longer, what are you passing? What moral, you know, lessons are you teaching those people? So I will tell you that uh, perhaps um, that the, the, those kind of people, they are in suspended animation. I hope that at one point they will rise again. Because without them, without the conscience of society, like the Ghan, uh, Ghani family means of this world, the society will 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 rust. It will become um, a place of uh, uh, you know uh, the stronger. The, you know the, the, when you are strong, that is when you, you have the might. The, the society give, for quickly, the mighty. Quickly, for inside the you, man. Would you give any kudos so the to the likes of? Would you give any kudos to the likes of Bishop uh, Matthew Kuka? Well, yes, I think um, in, uh, Kuka. But the point, again, my brother, is that when you now come up to uh, criticize, they label you an enemy, and they come after you. I think that is the fear that people now have, that they are no longer coming out. But I should brace that fear, because life is about what you have left behind. It's not about the acquisitions or, what, you know, the wealth you have. It is about how many people have you touched. By speaking up, by condemning things that are wrong, you are telling people who are in power to change. But if they, you don't have those people who will provide the alternative views, what you are seeing is that there, there will be those who think that uh, it's business as usual. They can continue to oppress and suppress and treat everybody, trample on people's uh, rights, and think that they can get away with it. But that is not sustainable. I'm hoping that um, some people will also emulate uh, the cookers, the uh, Ghanifa Emis, the, the uh, Bekos, the Ransom, Kumada Fumilaya was um, a great fighter, and so on. And so we have them, they are there, but let them not, we must not allow them to, to die. We must not allow them to become extinct. extinct. They, we must not allow them to become history. Let us revise. Let us come alive with uh, the vibrant Nigerian that we know. Nigerians that cannot keep quiet. Nigerians that can stand up to military dictatorship. What has happened to us? Things are happening today that if they happened before, the people will be on the street to fight. You are not there to uh, uh, fight war, but for human rights. Okay. For the protection of uh, the common people. The common people are suffering. They don't have people who are speaking up for them. How, can, how long can this continue? I hope and I pray that we rediscover all right. Uh, just just before, you know, we, we let you go in no time, uh, let's also look at one of the things that Desmond Tutu was great about. I mean, the fact that he, I'm sure you've mentioned it in the course of this discourse, the fact that he played a major role in unifying ethnic groups in South Africa, and that's why he's popularly associated with that, um, you know, term uh, Rainbow Nation. Although he later confessed that he didn't actually like how, uh, he didn't like the way things actually panned out eventually. 
But my concern is, for us back here in Nigeria, major concern is the fact that multiple ethnic groups, what are the dangers of that? And how can we manage? That was one of the conversations we had this morning uh, with my colleague when we saw that um, yesterday, some Christians, I mean, some Muslims actually went to celebrate with Christians. So how can we manage all of this, uh, you know, multi-ethnic groups in one country? How do we manage that? Because it's a major, uh, you know, problem for us here in Nigeria. You heard about the term unity in diversity. And that is what the good Lord that brought every Nigerian where we are now. We remember we didn't have any choice about where the family we came from or the country we came from. So it is left for us, God has given us that free will to be able to manage it. You know, um, I should we should see our diversity as uh, an opportunity, you know, to you know, get together. It's an advantage. It shouldn't be, um, uh, what is it called, um, uh, disadvantage. Because if God wanted us to come from any other place, he would have done so. Let us make the best that we can. If he gave you oranges, try to make um, bring um, orange juice. Uh, God gave you whatever it is, try to utilize it. It is about how you manage what God has given you. And then to be able to make the best out of it. We shouldn't be complaining about the fact that we have so many ethnic groups. And who are we? Did we create ourselves? And what right do we have to question other people why, why they, are, they are existing? Why don't we cultivate that Ubuntu? That I am because you are. Without you, I am nothing. But with you, I am everything. I am complete. Complementarity. Let us complete each other. It's like a marriage. A husband and a wife. The wife is incomplete. The husband is incomplete. But when they come together, they become one flesh. That is what the Holy Book tells us. Let us think about that. Don't uh, divide. Let us not concentrate on things that divide us. Religion or ethnicity or, you know, whatever. Let us use those to become humanity. Humanity is one. There is one God, no matter your denomination. I haven't seen any religion that talked about uh, a different God. It's the same God. So why can't we agree? But also, it is about human frailty. We should not be surprised about it, but let us manage it. Let us be able to make, you see that as an opportunity to contribute. The contributions we make is about unity, is about harmony, is about living together, is about coexistence. And, you know, utilizing the strength that each and every one of us has. Don't concentrate on the weaknesses. Don't look at our, our you know, the fact that we are incomplete. Because we are, as human beings. Otherwise, we are, the saints are not, you don't have living saints anymore. The saints are somewhere in heaven. Right. We are human beings. We have our weaknesses and shortcomings and imperfections. But that should not stop us from working together. As um, you know, you saw those who are lifting Nigeria. You know, together we can do more. Each person that. can bring out the best in themselves. All but right. when we are working in silos, when we begin to do things uh, individually, it does not take us very far. Let us unite as Absol a nation, absolutely. as a country, and as a world. Absolutely. Uh, we have a tribute from uh, the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, that we're going to share just before we say uh, quick goodbyes. Uh, so just quickly enjoy this. In this season of cheer and goodwill, at a time when many people are celebrating with family and friends, we have lost one of the most illustrious, courageous, and beloved amongst us. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was one of our nation's finest patriots. He was a man of unwavering courage, of principled conviction, and whose life was spent in the service of others. He in many ways embodied the essence of our humanity. Knowing he had been ill for some time now, does very little to lessen the blow that has been dealt to South Africa this very sad day.
And that's it from the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa. He's not the only one. World leaders uh, have, of course, shared uh, similar messages uh, on the death of uh, Archbishop Desmond Impilo Tutu. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul Ejime. Always uh, interested in speaking with you and hearing your perspective on these uh, topics. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for having me. And God bless you all. All right. All right. Our next conversation is here in Nigeria. A couple of days ago, the federal government, uh, of course, uh, made an announcement that in the spirit of Christmas, there was going to be free train rides um, across the country. But that didn't seem to go as planned. And that's what we're talking about next with the uh, President General National Union of Rail Transport Workers, Innocent Ajiji, who's uh, going to be sharing with us why it seems like tickets were still sold at even higher prices. Uh, over the weekend. We'll be back.